On today's episode, you'll get to hear Brave Woman says no to celebrating white men for killing others, Richard Burr's 4D chess game by voting guilty on Trump's impeachment, how regulating food delivery company charges won't at all upset the economic balance, and all the costs will definitely only affect those at the top of the company, and how COVID lockdowns haven't at all impeded any liberties, and the government is totally cool to shut down businesses. This is Cringe Posts. Welcome on in. We're excited today. I'm Donald. And I'm Britt. And we're going to go ahead and take on those online takes. Uh, but of course, we do start out by self-reflecting and giving you the chance to cringe at our past takes. And so this week, we get to see a wonderful post by our friend Britt, which is Romney wins. And this one's a twofer because in the likes section, <laughs> you do get to see it was also liked by one Donald Kimball. So I don't get to escape unblemished this week either. <laughs> Yeah, I, Romney wins third of October two thousand twelve. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I had no good reason for thinking that. I was gonna say, I wonder <laughs> if that was the night of a debate or something, um, or I, there had to have been you know, something he, that spurred it, right? He did pretty good. I, I remember something he did good at a debate, and Obama didn't look very good. But I mean, I, I don't really remember anything about that. I, I highly doubt he actually did good. I was gonna say, my... yeah, it probably had to do with what the narrative was, you know, <laughs> what the corporate yeah. narrative was. Yeah, in my mind, maybe he did good. It's just like, you know, uh, when I think about Romney, I just think of kind of squishy, you know, like <laughs> yeah. he's he 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 has no principles to stand on. He was basically Obama just with an R in front of his name. Yeah, well, um, and a lot worse in some ways too. Well, so. I mean. The classic example of that is, I think it was the third debate, perhaps, uh, but one of the debates, and it's an infamous quote, but I think it gets made fun of for the wrong reasons, which is his infamous quote about binders full of women. And, of course, the left took that and ran with it. They're like, oh, binders full of women, <laughs> you know, sort of lowest common denominator humor. But what's really pathetic about the whole binders full of women line to me was it showed exactly how squishy this Romney character is because he takes the exact premise that Obama puts in front and the, and the general the sort of intersectional left puts in front, not to say Obama's part of that, but he was, you know, using it for, to his advantage, which is Republicans are sexist. It's sexist to not have 50% CEOs, male, female, whatever. And, Rather than fighting back and pushing that narrative to say, no, we're making the best qualified choices and women have strengths that men don't. But in this particular instance, I mean, no, he goes, no, 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 please, please. We, we had binders full of women. We were we were trying to put women in equal 50 50. It, and it just is groveling and it's accepting their, uh, his premise. Yeah, it, it's I will do anything for power. And thankfully, uh, he got neither. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Neither respect nor power. Yeah, perhaps the most infamous photo of him now is the one at dinner with Trump where he looks absolutely oh. humiliated. I don't know. <laughs> I love it. I, lo I love that photo. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of Trump, no. but uh, I'm a big fan of what he made all these other guys do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. <laughs> well, anyway, beside, uh, beside Romney winning, uh, what else have we got on the cards for us today? We have uh, our first quick cringe, which is... I'm just done celebrating white men for killing people who speak differently, eat differently, and worship differently. <laughs> when I uh, when I thought about this one, because what really strikes me is the done part, like the past tense, as it infers that at some point this person did celebrate white men for killing people <laughs> who speak differently and eat differently. And I was like, okay, how could that make sense? Maybe she's talking about, you know, Joe Biden or George Bush or, or Dick Cheney, you know, all white men that killed, you know, people that look different and worship differently, uh, mercilessly, and a lot of people celebrated them. But I don't think that's what this person was talking about. <laughs> I think it, I think it belies kind of the ideological difference that tends to show itself in a lack of empathy. I think studies have been done that show people who are generally more conservative tend to be able to put the opposing perspective, argue from that perspective a little bit better. And people who are more on the left are unable to do that. And I think just the phrasing of this right there betrays that, where it's, I'm just mm. done celebrating white men for killing people who speak differently, yada, yada. And 
you know, you could, if you take the most generous interpretation of this kind of thing, most of the time you're not celebrating the people who have done these things for those actions. Like Columbus, for instance, nobody who is celebrating Columbus is trying to celebrate him. Oh, because he eliminated, you know, savages or whatnot. They're usually lauding his exploration and founding of America. And you can have problems with that and whatnot, but this it's it seems like again a, a valid critique that's just probably aimed in the total wrong direction. Um, like you said, it's not, and and again, making it about white men is just <laughs> off the mark because you could throw in all kinds of people yeah. who've done this rightfully critiquing. So add to your list of you know Bush and Biden and so forth. Add Condoleezza Rice. Add you know uh, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think this was in, um, I know we don't have the date here, but I remember it was specifically about the, the guy who shot up the spas. Um, and I, there, I think of the eight people he killed, six of them were Asians and, uh, the left really made a huge deal that there's all this Asian hate and all these different sorts of things going on. And the, the guy who did it, who actually committed the murder said, no, like I didn't kill them cause they're Asian. Like I killed them because they were offering sex services you know, at their spa. And, you know, that, you know, that was obviously abhorrent. I hate that he did that. And that's awful. Um, but what's just so funny is, you know, the, the left was going about saying, Hey, like, no, he, he's lying. He actually killed them because he's racist. And in their minds, it is worse to be racist than to be a murderer. Yeah. They would rather the racist thing stick to this guy than the murderer charge. And to me, it's like, man, he killed eight people. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't matter if six of them were Asian or two of them were white or whatever. Like, eight people were killed for no other reason. Well, I mean, they were doing something that I personally wouldn't advocate for. But regardless, like, they were doing something that doesn't deserve to be murdered for. They didn't deserve that. No. And uh, apparently for these people, though, it's it's way worse to be racist than to, to be a murderer. Yeah. And and it, it was an odd scenario because because of the diversion of focus, I guess, from what actually happened to this whole racist line is you ended up with takes like this, which in the yeah. abstract, are so useless. I mean, <laughs> at the very least, although I would disagree, a move to curb gun violence through some kind of gun law at least gives you a call to action of something meaningful. I think it's a that would be a bad direction to move, but at least it's a little bit more co more coherent than, than this weird intersectional take. I don't know. Yeah, you know, uh, I remember I was, I was having dinner with a friend four or five years ago, and they were going on and on about systemic racism. I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't – anything that's systemically racist, I don't like either. But can you point to it and tell me what system is racist in the United States? Like what law is racist? And, you know, there are some people that can make good arguments for certain things. You know, we had like redlining, you know, a bunch of years ago and all sorts of things like that that were awful. But uh, – this person couldn't point to anything. They just were repeating the, you know, parroting the narrative that they had fed to them by CNN or whoever, uh, or the Young Turks, and uh, and they their their premise wasn't founded upon anything. And because it wasn't founded upon anything, they actually had nowhere to go, right? And that's the same thing with this. It's like, it's like, okay, point, please point to me, person who is celebrating this white man for killing these other people. Mm -hmm. Like, I really can't think of anyone that society wouldn't at mask you know condemn as psychotic or mentally inept uh basically anyone that we consider normal is not celebrating anyone for killing anybody right um in general i mean obviously we've got the kind of the outliers of uh, all the wars for the past dozens of years right. but um even then though there's still a little bit coherent logic there you know because we were fed the lie that they hated us for our freedom yeah but uh <laughs> Yeah, it's and that's and that's the unfortunate part, right? Like you've got all this uh, all this pent up anger and passion about something that justifiably is bad, and then it gets misdirected with these platitudes and things that don't actually result in the world becoming better. They just result in the individual who posts them feeling a little bit better about themselves. Right, and you end up with people who then again go down this this intersectional path, and you cause such stark, I don't know, react reactions that. You have someone like Kyle Rittenhouse who had to defend himself mm. and was trying to defend property. And on one side, you just have a, an inconsolable left who cannot fathom that he was acting in self-defense and that when people are saying he should be free, it's not a celebration. It's not, yeah, he killed people. It's no, we need to take a stand to be able to defend yourself and your property. So I think that's part of it too, is it muddies moments where you actually can 
defend yourself. It muddies when things actually should mm-hmm. be condemned for killing, like, you know, administrations like the presidential ones that have actually done harm for no other reason than the military industrial complex. And so you end up charging all your anger towards someone like Kyle Rittenhouse when it should be completely directed somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's interesting you bring up the Rittenhouse one because I I see a lot, and these are locked deep in the, the cringe vaults that we'll probably pull out at some point, but a lot of different memes of like, you know, they, I, they, I can't remember who it was, but someone recently was shot, you know, a person of color was shot and they had a meme of, you know, Kyle Rittenhouse, like, this is what a white person can do. And it has that famous picture of him walking with his rifle, you know, it's like, dude, like if you had actually, has anyone ever watched the video mm-hmm. of Rittenhouse? It's like the poor guy was chased down. Yeah. Like, I think it was stupid for him to be there in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Like you shouldn't run towards conflict like that mm-hmm. unless, you know, you actively see innocent people being hurt. But Regardless, like someone tried to kill him, they threw they threw a bunch of material at him. Some of it was on fire. Another guy pulled a gun on him. Yep. He didn't shoot the guy until the other guy pulled a gun on him. That's justifiable defense in every aspect that can be defined. Yeah. Um, and so these people that post these things, they're not actually informed. They're not actually looking into stuff. They read the headline, maybe, maybe, uh, and then they they parrot something off like this, and it makes them feel better. And uh, they continue down that spiral of delusion until. Like you were saying, they're kind of a professional, useless person yeah. that feels really good about themselves. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it it ends up dividing and conquering people to the point of ridiculousness. And again, it's just such an abstract, weird take to have that. I think it gave <laughs> both of us a good dose of cringe here. So, yep. There you go. Moving to our next one, we've got this absolute gem of a comment, and this is in relation to the vote on Trump's impeachment where Senator Burr voted to convict Donald Trump for impeachment, who is a Republican for the record. This comment says, I wonder if Burr's vote was a clever rouge to make the voters of North Carolina turn out to support Laura Trump. Thinking about it, he announced he wasn't running, rather retiring. Laura I is a Trump, so there's heavy pushback against the family which Democrats could use to flip the seat. By voting guilty, he enraged his local party who will rally heavily behind Laura. (laughs) I think this was strategic and kind of brilliant. (laughs) He all but ensured her victory. So thank you, Burr. One more Republican Trump in 2022. (laughs) This is that mental gymnastics meme incarnate. Oh my goodness. We should make one of those for this one, man. Like <laughs> yeah. I can, the, like the one where they're like going over the, uh, like doing the backflip over the boxes. Yeah. It's by voting guilty, he enraged his local party, who will rally heavily behind Laura. And then at the end, this was strategic and kind of brilliant. <laughs> you know, it really seems to me like he announced he was retiring, and he knew that he ha- could vote guilty because he thought guilty. That seems like it's pretty much it to me. Uh, But yeah, sure, I'm sure it's a strategic move because Laura Trump is thinking about running for the seat and by, you know, doing something against the Trumps that makes her look more complicit, it actually will make people support her more and rally the base, even though it gives more uh, line for the Democrats to say even Burr voted to convict. I don't know. I don't get it. (laughs) How, how long has Burr been in, in the Senate? Oh, man. I, if he's like other senators, probably a couple hundred years. I, I don't know. R- Richard Burr. Yeah. He, he started serving in – or he started he, – his first time in federal government was in 1995. Yeah. So, yeah, this guy's been in the government for 25-plus years. Have you ever thought of a politician that uh, took the – you know, the selfless lay and sacrifice themselves for another politician. (laughs) And that, you know, I don't think you can have a 25 year career if you, if you're, you know, have the practice of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. doesn't really sound like those kind of people. (laughs) (laughs) Not at all. Well, and and I mean, especially for a non-establishment, you know, group like Trump, you know, like if he's been in there for 25 years, he's as establishment as they come. Right. And, uh, he definitely hated that Trump was in there. There's no way that he'd play the, the self-sacrifice play for Laura Trump. No, absolutely not. And and even on a just a strategic level, it does not make any sense that even if that was his plan, which you have to read so far into to get there, but even if that is his plan, 
how i mean how do you think that rallying the base of you know republican voters <laughs> I'm making them mad it? yeah i mean doesn't that just divide your republican party more doesn't that embolden the never trumpers to say look we have someone who voted no even he said he was guilty you know what i mean like that doesn't do you any favors it just divides your republican party more i can speak out of experience of washington that we're a very uh lefty and sort of establishment type state and we ran a very pro-trumpy guy for governor this last cycle and he did he he, he did outperform trump but it was just by about i don't know three or four points and it was well below the normal threshold. I want to say he got 38% or something like that, which mm. in Washington state, I think I, I even during an, a pretty, I think Trump's last or first term running, I think the candidate before him got like 42 or 44%. So, you know, having, having very stark opinions toward Trump in a state that may or may not favor him. I would imagine North Carolina is very pro-Trump in the Republican Party. So making a very anti-Trump statement <laughs> does not help rally the base. It helps maybe anger that very core vote, but it does not help expand his reach for an election in 2022 for Laura Trump. That That is too much for me to, to believe. But. Yeah. I, and this is kind of like, I guess, more indicative of the the entire Trump base that Basically, up until Biden was inaugurated, was saying that Trump had some 4D chess move he was going to play where he walks away with being president yeah. supreme forever. And I just I, I will have to pull some of those out later. But I just I love all these people that come up with these different conspiracy theories because, you know, they in the same way that the left kind of gets uh, blinded by what they think should happen or what can happen, you know, basic lack of belief in economics, uh, you know, the, the, the conservative voters just love their guy and they will believe anything and make up any sort of story to make it fit in their head that they're going to get their way. And, uh, all the way up until, I mean, I bet there's still people out there today, you know, four or five months after Trump hasn't, you know, officially lost the election that are claiming that he still has a way to make it back in. Yeah. It's um, the, it's the classic, here's how Bernie can still win, but Trump. Yeah. Style, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh man. All right. Well, we'll move on from this one uh, enough to make, to make you, have a headache here. All right, and here's a here's a good comment. I he so this was to give some context, yeah. just so that people have it. This was uh, this comment was in response to someone complaining about uh, the governor mandating uh, that DoorDash and and Uber Eats and some of these other different companies could not uh, charge certain amounts of fees to restaurants for deliveries. And so this person drove for them and was really upset about it. Uh, and then this person replied to them. I'll let yeah, you read it. Yeah, and this is this was from Washington State again. I hear you. I write as I drive DoorDash, LOL. But the big delivery companies won't cut driving here. It'll cut into their profits. But you won't see it bounce back on the drivers because they'll lose their ability to deliver anything then. And even if they do, the remaining drivers are going to make a killing because they'll up delivery commissions to try and recruit more drivers. This is one thing that will help small businesses stay afloat, but might cut into the profits of upper level staff and owners of Uber and DoorDash, etc. Oh man. <laughs> I like that he used the word profits when talking about Uber and DoorDash, yeah, right. companies that have never ever made a profit ever <laughs> in their whole existence. I think I think in 2019, the year before this, I think combined these uh, food delivery services lost something like 800 million dollars. Yeah. Crazy, crazy amount. I mean, the only thing that does worse than that is usually the federal government. But, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> the only difference being that this actually had voluntary investment backing. <laughs> the government yes, is not voluntary. Yes, yes. And, uh, and eventually it'll be profitable, right? Like, that's the beauty of, of uh, venture capital is that you're willing to take risks on stuff that takes a long time or, you know, maybe medium time, you know, 10 to 15 years to become profitable. Mm -hmm. and, but I was thinking about when, when I read this, uh, like an example, because I remember when this happened and – Carissa and I, my wife, we were going to go, we wanted to order something from Taco Bell. It's like 10 minutes away from our house. And uh, previously, I think they had been offering delivery for something like $1 mm -hmm. or something like that, which was awesome. I was like, okay, yeah, we'll spend $1 to, to not have to drive 20 minutes round trip to go pick up you know, $10 worth of Taco Bell. And after this law was passed, uh, because there's costs associated with it and the way that those costs were recouped was you know, Uber and DoorDash charge it to the restaurant – now the delivery fee was more like $12, right? So we were having to spend $12 for delivery fees to order $10 worth of food. 
And so what we said is, eh, we're not going to do that. So Taco Bell didn't get our business, and the DoorDash driver didn't get to drive. And uh, we decided to, you know, make sandwiches at home and call it good. And in this scenario, you know, the driver didn't make any money, the restaurant didn't make any money, and, uh, you know, the DoorDash company didn't make any money. So everyone lost because uh, the distribution of where these costs need to be, you know, recouped was not done in the most effective and efficient way. The consumer's not going to bear that cost, right? Uber and DoorDash know that. They've got data on millions and millions and millions of transactions. And so they're like, well, shoot, if, you know, we can't recoup this cost from uh, the, the actual consumer, let's leverage it onto the restaurant. And the restaurants want business that they wouldn't otherwise have, and so they're willing to eat it. But when the federal government comes in, or not even the federal, this is just Jay Inslee, comes in and says, hey, you know, we, uh, we're going to make it, we're going to help out the restaurants by, by making it so that DoorDash and Uber can't charge you fees, he really just hurt them. And it, that's just the big irony of it all. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's it's just the height of hilarity that that this guy thinks that you know this is one thing that that will only hurt cut into the profits of upper level staff and owners. I, I, I just I I wonder how he thinks these businesses operate. Even if you do yeah. a normal um, DoorDash or Uber Eats, not through a particular restaurant delivery or anything like that, you have that now that like five dollar surcharge. That's just on any base delivery, no matter what. And that's not being, you can't take it off with coupons. You can't. So you have literally just turned away a whole slew of business. And and so what, what kills me is how he says it won't cut back on drivers or it won't, you won't see it bounce back on the drivers because they'll lose their ability to deliver anything. And even if they do, the remaining drivers are going to make a killing. And so he doesn't even believe in his own premise. And he, he the idea for him is it's like, Oh yeah, some people are gonna maybe lose their livelihood from this, but the ones who stay will get a lot of money in it. But even still, like, <laughs> I don't know where he thinks this extra capital is gonna come from. Again, on a business that is not currently profitable, so why he thinks they're just gonna increase their recruitment costs, and why does that help remaining drivers anyway? You you don't you don't help existing and new drivers by taking essentially taking part of the slice of the pie away from the whole equation yeah. and shrinking the whole money pot and forcing it in a certain direction. All you've done there is limit options and cut someone out from getting that money. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, um, the pie example is good, but maybe think of it more of like, Hey, we have to eat this whole pie. Like yeah. there, there's a whole pie of cost associated with getting food and delivering it from a restaurant to someone's door. And, like how what these companies do is awesome is they figure out okay who who has the big enough stomach to stomach each part of the cost right like hey uber and doordash are gonna you know the driver is gonna stomach the cost of wear and tear on their vehicle and their time and then the restaurant's gonna stomach you know maybe x amount of cost and then the consumer has an amount of cost that they're gonna stomach but then the governor comes in and basically says nope like every you know one person has to eat half of the pie and if that person doesn't have the stomach to do that, then the pie is not going to get eaten and no one's happy, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't actually work out. I mean, that's kind of a weird analogy, yeah. but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Like that's, and that's the beauty of, of prices and, and, and price distribution and recoupment is that it forces businesses to think through who needs to pay the cost for the service. It doesn't change that, you know, it costs $10 in fuel and $5 for the food and $15 for the person's time like that is there there's $30 worth of cost associated with delivering that Taco Bell it just depends on who's going to eat it and some people are more willing to eat it than others and that's the beauty is teamwork right that's what capitalism is that's what a free market is is teamwork people voluntarily taking on certain costs because it's in their best interest to do it yeah and uh, the restaurants were perfectly willing to take on the cost of the extra fees from DoorDash and maybe that would result in them charging a little bit more for the food, which in turn, from a perception standpoint, the consumer might be willing to pay, mm -hmm. right? But once it's forced in that way, there's just no way for, uh, yeah, it's, the perception can't actually play out and the equation can't play out in the way that it's supposed to for, for people to figure out what they need to do. Well, and just at its core, this this is, you know, hey, we're it's that, that picture of, uh, of Ralph from The Simpsons. I'm helping, you know, and everything's like on yeah. fire. And, and. Because they're like, we're going to help these small businesses out after we've shut them down, prevented them from <laughs> being able to do business. Hey, you know what? We're not going to let those greedy people at DoorDash, you know, charge you the, the, the convenience <laughs> fee. And and again, what, what, what about what's crazy about it is that like in your example, rather than having, the, you know, the DoorDash person be like, ah, darn, as a CEO, I'm going to cut into my profits here. 
what's going to happen is they're going to say, okay, well, DoorDash as a name is pretty darn big, right? Uber Eats, we're, we're pretty well known. The, the pandemic has caused people to have to turn to us in many cases. So, you know what? It'll take a hit if we pass it to consumers, but we think enough of them are going to pay for it that we're okay. But what you've really done is you've hurt, especially the individual small businesses that are relying on some way to get their food. They're not a chain. They're just an individual little place that was is absolutely yeah. relying on people being able to eat there. And if they're shut down because they can't have people inside, then their only other option is takeout. And if, you know, DoorDash isn't allowed to charge them and then people are like, well, it's not worth it for me to use DoorDash, you've now made the the likelihood of someone who's going to go out and do takeout so much, so much smaller when they have to compete with like Taco Bell or Taco Time. If people are in the mood to buy, to spend on DoorDash already, they, they're probably a little bit more willing to go for a small business to get some good food. But when it's a matter of you actually have to go out and get it yourself, you probably just want to go what's near. You just want to go with what's convenient, what's already going to be cheap. Yeah. And so you've really, really hurt the non-chain small businesses who are already having a tough time because eating indoors at one of their places is more of an attraction than like a Taco Bell. And you furthermore do that when you cut off their access to delivery unless they want to do it themselves now. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting that what you mentioned about like DoorDash may have voluntarily passed this cost off consumers. And what that got me thinking about was like, OK, how would they determine how much of the cost to pass mm -hmm. off to the consumers? Because I, I agree with you. They very well might have decided like, shoot, we need to take some of the cost away from the restaurant owner, put it on the consumer. But now because it's a mandated threshold, I, I can't remember what it was, but they don't have any ability to actually figure what that ideal threshold is, right? Where they actually need to price it. Exactly. And so now they're just like, oh, well, I guess we're going to go up to the max amount that we're allowed to and we'll just go from there. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, that option and that ability to problem solve has been taken away from them. And that's like the beauty of capitalism and business owners and stuff is they solve problems, right? They solve pricing problems. They solve actual product problems. And with the pricing problem, getting feedback based on the supply and demand from the market, you know, when I charge X amount of dollars for something, my demand goes down or goes up by this much, you know, that's an essential piece of the equation for determining, you know, what you can actually do. And if you're, you know, it, it's really important, too, because if you, uh, if you can't charge, uh, have a nice equilibrium of the supply and demand curves, uh, then you need to solve how to make your actual cost of your product cheaper, right? And so that drives innovation. But when that price floor and that price incentive is taken away, innovation stops, right? So there might have been, what's crazy and what sucks is there's the, the opportunity cost that we'll never know that was lost from this, mm -hmm. right? Like maybe DoorDash, by knowing that they could do some other sort of crazy pricing scheme, could have figured out some new innovative way to charge this to customers or a new way of delivering food that everyone would have benefited from, right? But that innovation and the desire to innovate was taken away by having a price ceiling. And that's uh, that's really sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's whenever you fix part of that equation, like you said, it, it, it it's central planners who think that they can control the economy by try and try to prescribe outcomes by fixing the method. Hmm. And you just can't do that. It's just, it's impossible because economics is human behavior. And there are some general rules and principles that people will follow and abide, but you cannot control for those like you can a scientific equation. It's just not how it works. So anyway, that was enough to make to make me cringe. I'll, I'll, unless there's any more Same. you wanted to. <laughs> to no, I'm good. I got it all out. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so now we'll move on to our long form cringe. And this one is a good one. Starting the top left down into the right. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Businesses are not people. The government has the right to interfere in them. This has been the case since the Civil War. Not only that, but what you are arguing is placing the lives of those who are marginalized and vulnerable over the value of the bottom dollar. Consider this. An economy that cannot function without the sacrifice of the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of even its most basic citizenry is not a functional economy. And uh, our good friend Britt replied to this comment with the meme of uh, Palpatine from Star Wars in the, in the Senate chamber saying, It is with great reluctance that I have agreed to this calling. I love democracy. I love the Republic. Once this crisis has abated, I will lay down the powers you have given me. And then um, <laughs> the comment continues after that reply to that meme from the original poster here, I believe, saying, 
okay, but this isn't some grab for power. This is using the power the government already has. And this is about COVID lockdowns, to, to clarify here. Oh. This is using the power the government already has. This is literally what every professional I know says is the right move. I don't understand why you are so mad. You won't get arrested for going in public. You're not getting thrown in the back of a van. Your, your liberties are not being impaired. He is literally making it easier for people to now follow the rules by telling restaurants they now have to follow a new standard for a certain period of time. Arguing that this is an overreach of power is tantamount to saying that regular health inspections of restaurants, it's, it is. It's a false equivalency. If you're any... If you were any to use a more appropriate Star Wars comparison, this is the Jedi Council preventing the set, preventing the study of Sith powers, so that the so that younglings are not corrupted by their ancient power. A precautionary measure made under the advisement of those who study this. Oh my gosh, I uh, barely no, could man. handle that. That is so <laughs> bad. Oh my goodness. So 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 for some context, for those of you watching, you can see down here, this was posted about a year ago, uh, back in, I think it was March or April or May, right when COVID lockdown started. And uh, my favorite part of this is the, you're not going to get arrested for going in public. I know. You're not going to get thrown in the back of a van. It's like, huh? Like, I don't know, man. We were all warning about that. And uh, it seems like that happened quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I re freaking remember they sent a freaking uh, helicopter out into like the mountains because there were some people camping there without masks and not obeying the social, like di not the social distancing, but the lockdown mm -hmm. orders. Yeah. Like they sent, they spent our money to send a helicopter into the mountains to get people that were camping by themselves mm -hmm. and to lock them up. And there was that one dude on the paddleboard. Um, I think that was in California. Like he was paddleboarding by himself and the, the police like followed him out there and had, you know, basically violated the social distancing rules. He was by himself <laughs> yeah. and then the police got within six feet to arrest this guy. Yeah. It's just well, and, crazy, and obviously man. not the United States, but in Canada, there's the video from Thanksgiving of them literally pulling a an old lady out of a house for a Thanksgiving gathering, and they're physically pulling her out. And oh my god! Uh, again, not not the U.S., so a little different, but it's along the same principles here. You know, <laughs> I don't think too many people would balk at the comparison of the United States and Canada. It's not like Venezuela and the U.S. or anything like that. Well, they had those in, in – um, remember, they had the police going door-to-door, -door, breaking up gatherings in New York for Jews, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Which, like, that – it's like that sounds like something out of some Netflix dystopian show, right? Yeah. Like, where, where Nazi Germany takes over the U.S. Like, yeah. that's – and that happened, right? That's crazy that that happened. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot to pick apart in here. The uh, Let's maybe just begin with the first sentences. Businesses are not people. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about that? Well, it's such a funny idea that – businesses aren't people but the lockdowns are affecting human behavior so it's, there's no real difference between the two based on this order right you're saying that people cannot operate their business their voluntary exchange and and serve other people who voluntarily want to come in so yeah businesses aren't people they're they're people who are doing voluntary exchanges and agreements <laughs> so your your whole premise is flawed from the beginning the government has a right to interfere in them this has been the case since the Civil War. Okay, well, again, by this logic, you're, you're just saying that the business has the right to violate any individual's rights because all, the, all businesses are is collective human action in voluntary exchanges. So if you, if you accept the premise that you can regulate businesses like this, then you accept the, any, essentially no limits on human intervention in, this, in the same way. Shutting down a business from from operating is no different than shutting down a human from being able to pursue his happiness or life or liberty as the later co sentence in this comment says you know uh, <laughs> an economy that can't function without the sacrifice of life liberty and pursuit of happiness of its most basic isn't isn't functional like what an absurd <laughs> thing to say what an absolutely absurd comment i don't know i i love that the the bedrock of this guy's argument is uh, that the government has the right to shut down and mandate that people can't work mm -hmm. uh, is that it's been the case since the Civil War when uh, uh, the great hero, Abraham Lincoln, suspended habeas corpus and, <laughs> yeah. and jailed journalists. Yeah. It's like, okay, sh like, yeah, that sounds awesome, man. <laughs> like, that's a really good, good example for us. Uh, literal tyranny, you know, in the streets. Um, and that's just it drives me nuts right because like the it's the same thing we we're talking about with the the person that was talking about uh just done celebrating white people like kind of 
kind of cringe on autopilot, I guess, where they uh, they're like, well, Civil War, good, because we freed slaves. <laughs> this happened during Civil War. Reference that. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. it's like, oh, <laughs> like, no, that's not how it works. Um, oh, my favorite part, though, too, is uh, there's a lot of favorite parts yeah, in this. I was going to say, I was gonna the, say that the whole time. <laughs> And the second one is, uh, I mean, obviously he got the, you won't get arrested for going in public. Mm -hmm. Like, he got that mm -hmm. totally wrong. But where he says, your liberties are not being impaired. It's like, what is the definition of liberties to you, dude? Being able to go outside, being able to talk to people, being able to, you know, work and provide for my family. I can't do any of those things, but so th what is that? Is my liberty just to be, you know, a person in a vat uh, with, uh, you know, a bunch of liquid you know, Soylent Green being pumped into my veins. Like, that's apparently what liberty is. This person is just being alive. Well, I, I, um, would, I would hazard a guess that conveniently the definition of human liberty coincides with things this person likes to do and can still do indoors. Yeah. <laughs> By themselves. Right. I, I'm with a, a mask on. I'm a gamer, <laughs> so I can stay indoors during all these lockdowns, and my life hasn't changed. My liberties aren't being impeded. You know, yeah, <laughs> that's what that's what the definition of liberty is. Well, oh my I, goodness. I, I have to point out my, one of my favorite, you know, because we always have to say this is my favorite because there's so much good in here. One of my favorites is um, not only that, but what you are arguing is placing the lives of those who are marginalized and vulnerable over the value of the bottom dollar. Oh, my God. Now, let me ask you something. What do you think? Who do you think is more marginalized and vulnerable? A population that is susceptible to a disease that has a lower than 1% fatality rate or people who day to day live, you know, check to check, week to week, and are now unable to go to work because their business, the business they worked for is being mandatorily shut down by the government and can no longer feed their kids and have no money and no recompense for that because the government is forcing a shutdown over a disease that has a very low percentage rate. Who do you think is more marginalized and vulnerable in the scenario there? I, I do not understand the separation of economy, money, and reality livelihood. These people don't seem to understand that a functioning economy helps the marginalized and the poor because it gives them the ability to exchange. It gives them the ability to create and earn and to hopefully build their way out of their current situation. But when you put a functional stop on all of that, you've marginalized those people beyond what COVID can do. You want to talk about valuing human, human life. You've completely, not only on a rights and meaning of life level deprived these people, but you've just in general deprived them of the ability to work themselves out of poverty. And that can have much longer ramifications than catching a disease that is barely harmful to people, especially younger people. Yeah, it's, um, it's what's funny is, you know, these, these people don't understand how much effort it takes to keep and hold the world together. Um, you know, I work in the facilities business and with all the systems that support a facility. And I had a buddy who uh, he's like one of the guys that is responsible for making sure like the air systems in a hospital mm -hmm, are working, mm -hmm. uh, which is incredibly important. Right. Being able to suck out air out of an OR room, make sure that it's clean and processed and all that stuff is insanely important because you're working with tools and opening people up and you don't want dirty stuff to get in there. Like it's critical, absolutely critical for that person's life. And the amount of hours and time it takes to keep those machines running is, is takes a lot. It's a lot. And this guy, uh, you know, during the, the height of the lockdown, had driven there. He was walking in the hospital, and he has uh, one of these ladies screaming at him why he's still working and he's not, uh, you know, following the lockdown stuff. And it's like, lady, you don't understand. Like, if people don't go to work, buildings don't exist. Mm -hmm. Lights don't turn on. Plumbing doesn't flow. Food doesn't arrive at stores. You know, you don't have electricity for your gaming computer that you sit at home playing on. Like, it takes a lot of work to keep all this stuff together. It takes people working. That's the economy, yeah. right? The economy is us. And uh, and I think as, you know, I, I don't think it's any surprise that the people that are most, like you were mentioning earlier, the people who are most in favor of these lockdowns are probably people that have some sort of job where they sit in front of a computer all day or, uh, they, you know, maybe they live in their mom's basement and play video games or whatever, or they're a college student, right? Uh, like they don't actually have any sort of hands-on experience with how the world works and 
and just how much pain, suffering, and and sweat and equity it takes to make these things move. Right? It, it's a lot, and um, you know we're seeing that right now. You know, with uh, like all the different types of shortages we're having, right? Because we live in a just-in-time economy. Because our, you know, we're so used to having low prices that when shelves are empty at a store, you know, a truck is there to fill it back up. Well, surprise, surprise, in a just-in-time economy, if you shut down any part of the supply chain, even for a day, that cascades to a week of shortages, right? Because now you've broken that chain, and it takes a lot of effort to ramp that thing back up. And so these people that are saying, like, oh, like, you just hate, like, the bottom dollar, it's like, yeah, we care that people are able to, you know, you know provide for themselves and make a better lot in their life. But we also care about being able to eat. And, you know, thankfully, in capitalism, my success and your success are tied together in us having to work together for that to happen, right? And because, like, in the earlier conversation we are having about the, uh, you know, the DoorDash driver, when the government comes in and they mandate that you take certain precautions, that eliminates the general public from making the risk calculation to work together p- properly and in a way that, you know, still provides value. They took that all away. I love it that uh, he says in the second one, uh, he is literally making it easier for people to now follow the rules. He's making it easier by pointing a gun at you and th- threatening to throw you in jail. Right. That's not making it easier. You know, that's just – it's just crazy to me that, like, the perverse logic uh, these people take to twist themselves into to, like, think that this is good. Mm-hmm. This isn't good. Even if it was for a good reason, it's still not good. Like, the worst things in history were perpetrated under the guise of a good reason. Yeah. Well, and, and <clears throat> when he says things like – He's making it easier to follow the rules. That's his cope for his earlier statement of your your liberties are not being impaired, right? Because <laughs> in his mind, you just you're just making it easier to follow the rules. You can still choose to obey the rules because it's still easy to follow the rules because you have to. So your liberty isn't being impaired because you have are now forced to make the right choice. Um, because liberty is about making the choice that I think is correct, not you making your own determination. Um, when he says, for instance. <laughs> that liberties aren't being impaired and that this is, you know, a precedent set, all that as well. It's also kind of absurd when you consider, um, I can't remember which interview it was, but there was a go- an East Coast governor who, who'd implemented these harsh lockdowns and shut down businesses and, um, New Jersey, New, New Jersey. Jersey. Yeah. Governor. Yeah. And, and he gets asked, you know, what, what do you, you know, what, where do you get the authority in the United States constitution to do this? And we weren't, th- that's above my pay grade. We weren't thinking about the constitution when we did this. <laughs> and, and, and quite literally he, you know, this, he, as much cope as this commenter gives, there is no authority in the United States constitution for them to shut down businesses in this drastic manner either. So his cope about it's not impairing your liberties. It's, just making it all you care about the but all of it is this massive massive cope because he cannot handle the fact that this is one unconstitutional which in and of itself isn't like the most important metric to me but the fact that he's arguing that it is just shows the level of delusion that he's on two that liberty isn't being impaired and then three again not seeing the bottom dollar the importance of that i mean if if you're you know to put an example of what you were describing with that just in time economy let's say that that uh, friend working on the airflow system he's working and he needs a nice set of tools to operate and, and one of his yeah. tools breaks well he needs to go to a store where he can get those if the store that sells them is a specialty shop they could hypothetically not be getting used in the same way as what would be deemed an essential service could be shut down he can't get the tool he needs that then becomes essential to this hospital right yeah. uh you know, something could go out, a, 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 a something could break. You need someone to repair that thing. The person who needs to repair that thing, he needs to access a specialty something else. There's just an infinite number of chains of what people need and want and value in their lives. So beyond the basic tenets that human liberty means we get to value what is important and make decisions for our, ourselves, it doesn't matter what you or I judge as important. My liberty is not yours to control. But even beyond that, even if you reject that, human liberty idea deeming what is and isn't essential is an impossible task because everything is so interconnected all the way up through allowing cheap food for the most impoverished to be accessible so it's just it's so much of this person thinking that from their perspective they know what is best for every single person and what isn't isn't important 
and liberty only matters on the things that aren't important or the things that I deem acceptable for you to choose between. But for the things that really count, like this disease, it's just making it easier for you to follow the rules. And I'm not, you know, not upending your liberties. <laughs> Uh, you know, you and I both uh, love Star Wars, and I'm a huge Star Wars nerd, and so his his analogy just drove me nuts. It's like, dude, you haven't even read any of the Star Wars books or anything like that, because <laughs> if he had, if he had, he would know in the Revenge of the Sith novelization, the reason Anakin turns to the dark side is because he's not allowed to read the Sith holocrons, and Yoda and all those guys know it, because he wants to read it, and that's why he makes such a big deal about being a master, right? Like, mm. he's on the council, but he's not a master. To access the holocrons, you have to be a master. Mm. And so he goes and seeks it out from alternative sources and ends up uh, chopping off Mace Windu's, Windu's arm. But on top of all that, even though the analogy breaks down just from a, a literary standpoint, I just hate that he compares the government to the Jedi Council, wise Jedi Council, <laughs> and the general populace that works for their living as younglings mm -hmm. that are, need to be shepherded along and protected from evil ancient power. Yeah. <laughs> That's just such a – it's like, dude, you're talking about yourself. You realize that, right? Like, you're claiming that you are weak, powerless, and not informed when you say that. Obviously, he doesn't think that. He thinks that he is somehow part of the in-group, you know, because he's taking the uh, – he's a sheep, and he's taking the, uh, the, the line of uh, – the narrative line that they're feeding him. But, you know, this, this, this thought that the government is some grand, wise body of people that – can make decisions and make sure it goes well. The government never makes a proactive decision. They're always reactive. It's inerrant in how they're set up. And it's uh, to think that, uh, you know, the government that couldn't count votes correctly during, during the, you know, the primaries could somehow have the ability to manage a pandemic and make decisions based on each, you know, literally 300 million people's different uh, variable considerations is just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah, at the... At the very least, these people need to question the the idea that this government is a wise Jedi Council. Because while there are these lockdowns going down that you might agree with right now, let's say in your state, you also have to acknowledge that there are other state governments like Florida and Texas that are doing the complete opposite. Yeah. Now, in that yeah. scenario, I somehow think that the government doesn't become the Jedi Council for some reason. And I don't know if that's... The, I mean, I don't know. It seems to me like if you think they're the Jedi Council, the government's Jedi Council, it shouldn't matter what they do. You just trust them, right? Or does it conveniently align with what corporate and mainstream media propaganda you're hearing is the right thing? Yeah. Well, like he says, uh, what, every professional I know... or so, Doesn't he say that something? Yeah, this is literally yeah. what every professional I know says is the right move. Never mind that at the time, a year ago, Dr. Scott Atlas was being pr you know, promoted by the Trump administration saying things like, you don't need to wear a mask outside, masks do very little to... So not literally every professional that you know. Just the professionals that you want to hear and the professionals that you don't want to discount. It's always, always, always a matter of the government knows best unless someone in the government is doing something I don't like, in which case that's an outlier. Yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, another deep Star Wars take. It's uh, in the Clone Wars cartoon when Anakin gets lied to or discovers that the the, the council has been lying to him about Obi Wan dying. Uh, there's a meme that's whatever. What other lies have I been told by the council? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean that's I mean that's true, man. It's like, hey, in your analogy, the council is probably not the right people you want to be listening to, and that's <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. Well, they, he just you, you, they want to have their cake and eat it, too. They want to say the government knows best when it's something that the media is telling them is the good, right thing. And if the if again, if if the government does something that departs from that, you 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 just have to discount that part of it. You can't recognize that fundamentally the government is not a good institution to be instructing you what your life is doing or, or not doing. It, it doesn't matter who's in charge. It doesn't matter if Ron DeSantis is opening the economy, which is something I like. He still doesn't have the ability to tell me what yeah. to do. I can like that he's saying we're opening the economy, but ultimately it's not – I'm not liking that he has said that. I'm liking that, yeah, you're getting out of the way for me to live my life and use my rights as I'm intended. Whether or not you're in power, those are mine. So, yeah, I'm happy when you recognize that, but I'm not grateful to him per se. And so – but this person, again, is just – enshrines the government when they when they take control and make decisive action because 
that's what the media feeds them. Yeah, definitely. Well, anyway, unless you have any last thoughts, I think we'll wrap up and just say thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Cringe Posts. Make sure to check out our social media presence on Twitter, Instagram, Locals, and CringePosts.com, of course. And if there's anything we've said that made you cringe in this episode, let us know. Talk to us there, and uh, we will <laughs> we will cringe together. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thanks. See ya.